Okay, last time we talked in Article One about how Congress was set up. We talked about who got to be in Congress, the terms for senators and representatives, uh, the requirements to be a senator or a representative. We talked about how a bill became a law, the powers of Congress, and some of the things that Congress couldn't do. <clears throat> what we want to talk about today is how Congress actually functions in the here and now. That is to say, how does it work in those day-to-day -day sessions inside Congress? Let's start with the Senate. Theoretically, or at least according to the Constitution, the Vice President of the United States is the President of the Senate. But the Vice President rarely does that. He might do it the first time in each session, kind of bring it to order. In fact, the President pro temp is the one who runs the Senate. That means that's the one pounding the gavel. That's usually somebody who is uh, a longtime member of the Senate, somebody who is sort of a, I don't want to say honorary, but it's, it's a, an office that doesn't carry a lot of political power, but it is, is something you would give somebody who's served a long time. The majority party in the Senate usually uh, has that person chosen. Uh, the real leaders in the Senate are the, called the majority and minority leader. And that depends upon which party has power. If the Republicans have power, if they have uh, of the 100 senators, a majority in the Senate, then the leader of the Republican Party in the Senate is the majority leader. The leader of the Democratic Party is the minority leader. If the Democrats uh, gain power, then they simply change roles. And the role of the party leader is significant. They are the ones who are going to have a lot of influence in who gets on what committee, they're going to have a lot of influence in the negotiations. They're the ones who are going to be the face of their party to the media. Behind the scenes, you have people called party whips in the Senate. These are the people who work behind the scenes, making sure everybody gets to the vote and, more importantly, votes the right way. These are the people making the phone calls, sending the text messages uh, and the emails. They're the ones that run the structure of the party inside and out. So the party leader might be the face of the party. The party whip is the muscle behind the scenes. <clears throat> well, that's the Senate. How about in the House of Representatives? House of Representatives is led by a speaker, the Speaker of the House. Very Im important role. This is a person who is actually third in line to the presidency. There's the president, vice president, and the speaker of the house. This person is elected. He is elected by the house. Invariably, it's a, the leading member of the majority party because, again, they're going to vote along party lines. So if the majority of the uh, people in the House of Representatives are Republicans, then a Republican will be the speaker. Uh, the majority are Democrats. The Democratic candidate would be a speaker. This has been a very important role throughout history. In fact, early in American history, this was the position to have. Uh, many of our uh, founding fathers and others who were significant players in the first, say, 50 years of our country's history functioned from that role as Speaker of the House of Representatives. They have great power. They determine speaking order. They determine uh, the bills, uh, which committees they would be assigned to. They would determine who's going to be on the various committees. They're going to rule on motions. They are going to run the House of Representatives, and their power is significant. <clears throat> well, now that we have the players in, how does voting happen? Uh, there have been a number of ways that both the Senate and the House have voted throughout the years. Uh, one way is a simple voice vote. All in favor say aye, all opposed nay. That's a, a way that's voted in the past. Uh, a a long-term, or a long time ago, they used to do a thing called the teller, uh, voting by teller. Essentially, what would happen is they would take a person of each party, kind of put them side by side, and you would walk between them saying your vote. And since there was a person from each party, they could hold you accountable that way and hold each other accountable. And you'd kind of walk through there as if you'd walk through a threshold of the door. Don't really do that one anymore. Another one they don't do anymore, but uh, was around for a long time, was a vote by division. That's basically where you stand up and go to one side of the room or the other. Everybody yes on the right, everybody no on the left. <clears throat> the most common one that they really do these days is by roll call. And again, with computer technology, it's very easy to simply push a button and have it appear and there's a record of it. So roll call voting is the most important and the one that's done uh, most commonly in both the House and the Senate today. But then how do you vote? If you are a representative or a senator, how do you vote? What determines your voting? And you might think, well, that's simple. You'd vote you know, the way you feel. 
Well, that's, that's very noble and very wonderful, but that's not always how it happens. There are three factors that determine how a senator or a representative might vote. One would be uh, representational. This is, what do your constituents want? What do the people who elected you want you to do on this particular issue? Did you campaign on lower taxes? Did you campaign on increasing jobs? Did you campaign against um, federal funding for abortion clinics? What, what did you campaign on? What did you get elected uh, representing yourself as? And that is a factor in voting. Uh, it's not the only one, though, because you have a party. You have your organizational uh, rationale for voting. What does your party want? You, uh, your constituents, rather, might want you to vote a certain way. But your party, perhaps, is insisting, no, on this one, we need you to vote a different way because we want to make some deal with the party for a bill coming down the pike a little later. So your party might say, we want you to vote yes, where you had represented your uh, self to your constituents as saying no. And then the third one is attitudinal. What, what's your own attitude on this? What is your own personal preference? Again, perhaps uh, your heart leads you a certain way, uh, your party leads you a second way, and your constituents factor into that as well. Happy is the senator or representative where all of these line up. It's a, it's a wonderful day when a bill is before Congress and your own personal passions are a certain way, your constituents want you to vote that same way, and your party says, yes, that's the way to vote. Uh, and it happens that way frequently, but not always. Often, uh, candidate or senators or representatives are going to have to choose. They're going to have to choose, do I uh, vote what is maybe not what my constituents want, because maybe my own personal understanding is this is better for them. Uh, maybe it's better for the country, okay? Let me, let me give you an example from where I live. Out in the Antelope Valley, the defense industry, very important. Uh, <clears throat> Edwards Air Force Base, uh, some businesses out there related to that, Northrop. A representative uh, from the Antelope Valley would be very interested in making sure, making sure defense contracts go there that defense contracts go to those companies, that, that you know, Edwards Air Force Base stays functional and, and a lot of jobs, a lot of things going on. But what if uh, that particular representative recognizes that maybe it's best for the economy as a whole, maybe it's best for the country as a whole, that we actually close Edwards Air Force Base and move all of that to somewhere in Georgia? That would be a difficult decision for that person to have to make. Well. We talked last time when bills become law, they go through a process of committees. Okay, I wanna talk a little bit about committees. There are three kinds of committees, and this is true for both the Senate and the House. One kind of committee is called a standing committee. These are committees that meet regularly. They are standing, they're, they're always there. Uh, in the House, this would be something like, say, the Rules Committee. Uh, very important, when a bill comes in, it goes to the Rules Committee, and they're gonna set up uh, the rules by which that bill can be debated, what will be the time of debating amendments, et cetera. Uh, another important House committee is the Appropriations Committee. Again, all bills that have to do with spending money must begin in the House, and so it's gonna go to this Appropriations Committee where they're gonna look at the, the money that you want to spend to do whatever you want to do in your bill. Um, the Ways and Means Committee is another one, the International Relations Committee, and the Budget Committee. These are all very important standing committees in the House, and there are others. What about in the Senate? Again, the Senate also has an Appropriations Committee, of course. They're gonna have people who wanna determine how you spend money. Armed Forces Committee, that's our, excuse me, the Armed Services Committee. That's a very important uh, committee. You'll see that a lot in the newspaper, especially with the War on Terror. Budget Committee, Finance, Foreign Relations. But one of the most important in the Senate is the Judiciary Committee. When the President appoints a justice, whether it's to the Supreme Court or just to any federal court, that justice needs to be approved by the Senate. And to be approved by the Senate, you have to go through hearings for the Senate Judiciary Committee. So when there is a vacancy on the Supreme Court and the President appoints somebody, the Judiciary Committee of the Senate becomes ground zero for extensive debates and conversation about whether this person is worthy of being a Supreme Court Justice. Well, standing committees are one kind of committees, but there are others. There are what are called select committees. A select committee is a committee 
that meets only for a specific period of time to deal with a specific issue. For example, there might be uh, a particular issue that comes up that, um, that the Senate and the House or one or the other, they don't have to both do this, decide we want a committee to investigate this. These are often investigative. Uh, maybe something to do with um, detainees at Guantanamo Bay. It might have to do with something uh, like a presidential um, issue involving misappropriation of funds or concerns about that. It might have to do with something as common as uh, baseball. Uh, there have been certain select committees on you know, baseball and the, the uh, monopoly that baseball has. Uh, there could be one on, say, uh, current issue nowadays is should college athletes be paid. Uh, there might be a, a, a Senate or a House committee to look into this. These are select committees set up for a specific time, limited in power and scope. And then the last committee that we want to talk about we've already mentioned. This is a conference committee. This is a committee that is put together by members from the House and the Senate when they need to work out a compromise on a particular bill. Again, if you go back to our lecture last time, a bill has gone through the House and passed, it's gone through the Senate and passed, but it's passed in different forms. Maybe there's an amendment here, some wording change there. You need a conference committee to iron out those differences so that one single bill can be represented back to the House or Senate and then to the President. That's how Congress works day to day.